back BMR. How rude. Welcome back, BMR Clinical Problem Solvers. Um, today, Robbie, I was warned to have a very protein-heavy breakfast. <laughs> and I told you not. I ate my breakfast, and I told Robbie that I'm going to slam back a protein bar, true to my <laughs> word. And and I put up a backup protein bar, just in case. <laughs> Can you share with us why you sent me this message? Oh, my gosh. You know, we all get a little bit nervous uh, to varying degrees before these, but I got a message from my case presenter, Mark, saying... Uh, I, a little bit of a warning as to what's coming our way, including a directed message at Proferez's protein or actually nutritious intake. Um, Mark, uh, I have uh, seen Proferez and I have tried to match him, although this is my first round, with a lot of protein, fresh uh, avocado toast and an egg. So Dude, that looks I, incredible. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Did you yeah. toast? That's a toast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's toast. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and as in Prof Rez, look at us, we're in sync. I've come up with a backup meal. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think I'm going to be drowning in this food, uh, but probably drowning in your case more so. Uh, anyway, we've rambled on. Uh, I'll pass the mic to you to say hello, and then we'll jump in. Yeah, you guys both look very well nourished. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Mark, by the way. I'm one of the uh, CB Solvers Academy members. I'm a third year medicine. Uh, resident at Penn. Um, sorry, I'm in the hospital right now um, on the palm service. So if I, you know, step away for a sec, I hope everything's uh, settled and tucked in. But uh, if I look frantic, that's why. Uh, but yeah, very excited. This is probably, I would say this is probably my favorite case of residency, um, it, at least top two. So I'm very excited to present it. You are something else, my friend, to be presenting while on service. That's unreal. That's really, really cool. Thank you for, for doing that. And your love for medicine knows no bounds. We really appreciate it. All right, let's rock and roll. Awesome. Um, so today, so we have a patient. Um, she's a 37-year-old female, and she's presenting with two months of progressive, um, progressive dyspnea on exertion. Um, Prof. Reza, I, I, you would be surprised that actually I would love to divide and conquer because I've been thinking a lot about subacute diseases. And so I just want to take a moment to reflect on the subacute word that Mark used, two months, and then pass the mic to you. And gosh, you know, the odds of a CPS case being subacute is like 90%. Um, acute medicine often gets resolved acutely and chronic medicine either never gets figured out or is a, uh, is a chronic uh, neurodegenerative or simple disease of the organ. And I think you, we all have been spoiled by subacuity in many, many ways, in large part because on VMR, we find subacute diseases to be uh, very, very sneaky a whole list of esoteric sneaky conditions that often evade us, at least initially. But I think as we learn how to merge the uh, clinical reasoning world with the real world, we learn that subacute diseases come in two categories. The more practical approach is actually to emphasize that it's a subacute presentation of a very common disease. And what, what could that mean? It could be acuity that's stretched out a little bit, a longer version of what is otherwise typically an acute disease, either because of patient tolerating the disease or social factors or all sorts of things, or, or a compressed version of a chronic disease. So in real life, subacute is not so much a sneaky diagnosis as it likely will be today, but just a sneaky presentation of either a prolonged but typically acute disease or a compressed but typically a uh, chronic condition. Examples to hone this in, subacute altered mental status. You might find the patient has an autoimmune encephalitis, but if you look at the odds, the odds will tell you that they probably have a rapid version of Alzheimer's disease, or they tolerated hyponatremia much longer than the other their neighbor would have because they may not have had access to the hospital. So in real life, we should keep antennae up for both possibilities, though I think uh, we'll lean on the uh, sneaky disease category for, for Prof. Rez. Let me ask you, are you going to first take a bite into your toast or your oatmeal? Oh, oh toast for sure. It's got to be warm. Do you know what I've my been waiting for this to... moment for so long now. Dude, my grandfather used to say, when you're picking the sequence of your foods, always start with the savory and then go to the sweet. Because if you start with the sweet and then go to the savory, you'll just be disappointed. So in this context, 
You answered wrong, my friend. The toast is tastier, so you should start with the oatmeal. But you do you. There's no wrong way to do it. I'll be very brief here to say that um, I'll make a few very important points. One is when you see this patient at the bedside, they, will, they may look totally normal. Look at the keyword that Mark used, which is exertion. So it's really important for a patient like this that you walk with them to see what happens to the heart rate, what happens to the O2 sat. The other thing I'll say is we're all taught the dyspnea pyramid, but I wanna challenge you to go a little more in detail when you're dealing with the dyspnea pyramid. 95% of the time, it's either the heart or the lung, but think anatomically, what about the heart? Is it the valves? Is it the coronary vessels? Is it the electrical activity? Is it the pericardium? What about the lung? Just follow the, the pathway of air as you take a breath in. It's coming down through the trachea and going through the bronchi, eventually in the alveoli. You have the interstitial space um, and the pulmonary vessels. So at each of these, you can have a lesion, but if you apply base rate, it's almost always something to do with some kind of spasm like COPD or asthma. Uh, and then the third tier is blood. Anemia can definitely manifest with dyspnea and exertion, with angina. Um, and oftentimes people are anemic. They feel okay at rest, but it's really with movement that brings out their shortness of breath. There are other categories like thyroid disorder, deconditioning, body habitus, metabolic acidosis um, that can contribute to dyspnea exertion. So I would just say this, don't be reassured when you get to the bedside, if the patient looks fine, look for conjunctival pallor, palmar crease pallor, listen to the heart carefully, listen to the lung, even if everything is negative, note your exam is more specific than sensitive. So you're gonna get the chest X-ray, the EKG, the trope, the BNP and the hemoglobin. And that will be our first tier approach. But of course we need much more data from Mark and we need to know, is there any past medical history? Um, so Mike, back to you, Mark. Awesome, what a start. Um, so now we'll move on to the HPI. Um, so essentially two and a half months prior to the patient presenting, she developed a left lower extremity bruising and swelling. Um, she went to a, um, a local emergency department. She got left lower extremity Doppler that was negative for clot. Um, then two months prior to admission, she developed, you know, this dyspnea on exertion um, and a bilateral lower extremity rash. Um, a CBC was checked um, and the patient's hemoglobin was 6.7. A few weeks prior was relatively normal. Um, and she was also found to be newly iron deficient. So in the outpatient setting, she um, got iron supplementation. She got an EGD and colonoscopy to look for a uh, causes of iron deficiency anemia that was negative for any sources of bleed. Um, the patient also endured cementeraja, so a marina IUD was placed to see if that would help um, with her iron deficiency anemia, and that was one and a half weeks prior to admission. Like I said, in the outpatient setting, she got about five um, infusions of IV iron, um, but really, despite all these interventions, um, she continued to have progressive dyspnea. So she presented to the ED for further management. Um, a little bit about her background. Um, so she was actually diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism back in 2017. At that time, she, in terms of her ischemic stroke workup, she was found to have a PFO and also factor V Leiden. As part of the kind of stroke workup in a younger person, there were some autoimmune serologies that were sent. Um, and she had a positive RF and positive CCP. And she said she was diagnosed with um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, when you ask her question, she's denied any history um, of really joint pain. So I guess it was more of like a serological diagnosis. Um, her medication, she was on rivaroxaban and cetirizine. Um, her family history, her dad has asthma and her mom has mitral valve prolapse. Um, she has no surgical histories. Her social history, um, no tobacco or alcohol uh, use or illicit drug um, use. Um, she lives with her husband and six children, um, and uh, she works as a school teacher. And that's the end of this aliquot. Super rich um, aliquot. And Mark, just to clarify, was it a PE or was it a stroke in 2017? Um, sorry, yeah. It, so she, um, I should say, it was a stroke, not a PE. A no, stroke. Was, okay. No, no, stroke. no worries. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. And uh, what I'll do is I'll tackle the HPI, leave the past medical for Robbie, but realize that this is so rich. I expect Robbie to incorporate 
the rest of the HPI into analyzing the past medical history. I'm going to, for a second, ignore the past medical history, except for one component of it, the fact that she's on rivaroxaban. Uh, because we know this is a direct oral anticoagulant, and it increases your vulnerability to bleeding. When you look at this, this patient is having bruising in the lower extremities, is having iron deficiency, and has a rash. I would not be surprised if that rash is in fact a petechial rash because of extravasation of red blood cells from the blood vessel. Why do I say that? I'm prioritizing that. Of course, you have to look at the skin. It's because of the bruising. Because bruise is just a large petechiae. It goes petechiae purpura ecchymosis. And by definition, that's a non-blanching erythematous rash. And so the question becomes, why would someone bruise? Now, before we learned about the rivaroxaban, iron deficiency would not explain bruising. It's very important to understand that, that iron deficiency would not explain bruising. Anytime you have someone with bruising, you have to just activate your bleeding schema because you're literally bleeding into the skin. And probably the most important step is to say, was there trauma or not? Realize that someone who's on a DOAC may have subtle trauma that they don't recognize as trauma that leads to bruising. We see this often in elderly patients who have very fragile vessels just as a just because they're aging and the vessels are more fragile. So small hits will cause all those bruises that you see. When you're dealing with um, bruising or bleeding into the skin, it's a very simple framework. And that framework is understand the, hemo, um, the hematologic or hemostatic system, which includes the platelet, the PT, the PTT. That's always going to be the first tier. And then the next step is to look at the vessel, which may be pathologic vasculopathy or maybe inflamed vasculitis. But just like we did with dyspnea exertion, we should do the same thing with bleeding where we have to prioritize something abnormal within the hemostatic system. She is on rivaroxaban, so that does increase her vulnerability. So the question that becomes, should we go beyond this is just a person who's on a DOAC and is fragile to bleeding and has you know, uh, a coagulopathy because of a medical intervention Two, could there be something going on, on at the level of the vessel? And that's where I think the past medical history is going to be helpful, where Robbie will layer on. I will say that um, the petechial rash and the dyspnea, you have to start thinking, what is the overlap of the two? And the overlap could be bleeding into the lungs or it could just be anemia from iron deficiency or from bleeding elsewhere. So you really have to see what that parenchyma looks like with some form of imaging. You could also imagine if the vessels are fragile, maybe the vessels in the lung are also fragile. So beyond um, hemorrhage, thinking about other hematologic disorders like clots. So, from the HPI, what the additional information does for me is say, I want to examine that rash. Are we dealing with petechiae? If we have a disorder of vessels in one location, we're at risk of having a disorder of vessels in another location, which brings me to the pulmonary vascular system. So even a clear chest x-ray wouldn't prevent me from getting a CT study with contrast to better evaluate that uh, the lung and the, and the vessel. But I'll pass it on to Robbie to layer on the past medical history to see what he thinks. Prof, it's really complicated, isn't it? It's so it's such a foggy space. And I say that because when we're trying to analyze the relevance of the medical history, understanding what we're trying to make it relevant to or what we're going to try to attach it to <clears throat> makes it a much more productive exercise. And so if I'm trying to say, like, what should we try to look for relevance in the medical history? I think we can say we've, as you said, we've translated the subacute dyspnea exertion to be symptomatic anemia, 
but we're open to the possibility that there is something else that is contributing in the cardiopulmonary apparatus to that symptomatic anemia. And if we study that symptomatic anemia, we've made progress, as you said, to say that that should make us think um, that we are connecting it to iron deficiency. Though I think if we examine that, we should also be open to the possibility that that's a premature diagnosis. And maybe the amount of iron deficiency doesn't account for her degree of anemia. She has something else going on. And then, as you said, um, the clues to help understand the anemia is the petechial rash that she has which makes us think, does she have a, um, is she bleeding in her skin, i.e. does she have a blood problem? And so for me, I'm looking at this medical history and I'm trying to see, can I connect it to any of those ends? Can I connect the stroke and the autoimmune vibe in her history to, um, uh, to those ends? And I think the answer is yes, but not quickly. I don't know if I should connect it to a petechial rash. I don't know if I should connect it to iron deficiency. I don't know if I should connect it to a mysterious form of anemia where the iron deficiency is unclear or not. So honestly, it's hard to ignore the relevance of the medical history given its rarity. And I'll talk for a moment about that. But if I were trying to make the productive exercise of connecting the foreground, i.e. the HPI with the background, my mind is inclined to wait for a little bit more clarity on what the foreground is to make those connections more robust and less um, uh, less uh, Hail Marys, you know? Uh, I just had a football analogy, y'all. Cool. Uh, that's the only thing I know about uh, the fake football. Sorry. Anyway, uh, I can't believe we have to call it soccer. Anyway, 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 focus. <laughs> Stroke in a young person is very rare. Um, that's because, presumably this is an ischemic stroke, that's because atherosclerotic disease, the main mechanism of stroke in older adults, is less likely to be at play in younger patients. So what happens to the epidemiology of stroke in younger people? One, hemorrhagic strokes are much more common as a consequence of trauma. So that's the first thing to recognize, which she doesn't have. Within the ischemic strokes, if we go back to our trusted model of is there a problem in the pump? i.e. a cardioembolic disease? Is there a problem in the pipes, i.e. atherosclerosis or dissection? Or is there a problem in the blood, the plasma, like a hypercoagulable condition? What are things that you should prioritize in younger adults? One, the pipe problem isn't atherosclerosis, it's dissection. And the pump problem that you have to think about isn't regular old atrial fibrillation with thromboembolism, it's uh, um, uh, infectious endocarditis. So I think the rarity of the stroke in this young person is very unusual and should make us wonder if it's connected to anything that's going on. Her autoimmune fingerprint is just a fingerprint. It's not proof that there is autoimmunity there. Um, excited to hear more, Mark, and very, very uh, guarded uh, because I don't want to go down the wrong pathway. And I think that this case is a setup to do that for sure. Raleigh, please take a couple more bites of that toast, and I need you full strength. <laughs> you got it. I promise, no setups here. Um, so moving on to the physical exam and some of the basic labs. Um, so first our exam, um, the patient was afebrile. Blood pressure was 99 over 66. The heart rate was 119. And the oxygen saturation was 88% on room air. So she was placed on two liters nasal cannula. Um, generally, she was resting in bed in no acute distress, uh, distress, but she was dysmic with long sentences. Her neurological exam was uh, grossly intact. Um, nothing I really appreciate an HENT exam. Um, on her um, pulmonary exam, didn't appreciate any crackles. Um, on her cardiovascular exam, I appreciate an elevated JVP. She was tachycardic, but it was regular, and a systolic murmur was heard at the left lower sternal border. Cradum was soft, non tender, non distended. Her extremities were a little on the cooler side, um, uh, especially in the ankles and the legs, maybe a little warmer at the knees. And then I was wondering if I could just show a picture of the rash, because I feel like that's where the money is at um, that I have on my PowerPoint, if I could become co-host. Um, so it'll probably take me a second. Mark, while you're waiting to become co-host, what are you doing next year? Are you applying for gigs right now or... 
Yeah, I'm actually, I, I recently accepted a hospitalist job at Stanford. So I'm going to be a, a Stanford hospitalist. Um, so yeah. Wow. So you're yeah, yeah. next door neighbors to Robbie. Yes. Yeah. We'll all be in the same state. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> well, I take offense to it. You're further away from me. Yeah, that was on purpose, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, here is the, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. So here's the kind of zoomed out picture of the rash. And then I'll okay. zoom a little in. So here's the rash. And I'll wow. say it was non, non blanchable or uh, sorry, non palpable. And then, Mark, on that right leg, I, I'm seeing the left leg just there seems to be asymmetry there, like a large bruise, a little yep. bit of swelling. On that right leg, are those petechiae that we're seeing, like small little red yep. dots? Okay. Yeah, they appeared as petechiae. But yeah, you, there definitely is some asymmetric swelling. And that's yeah. kind of, she, she appreciated that. She's like, you know, that's what I went to the ED for the couple months before and got the ultrasound that was negative for DVT. And um, what I'd like you to do, Mark, is um, if you don't mind, go to the other image, the one that you had, and just sure. keep this up because I'm going to keep the images for Robbie to interpret and i already memorized what's on the whiteboard so i'll talk about the other um abnormal findings you know going straight to the vital signs this patient's o2 sat is 88 percent. this is abnormal now mark said one thing to us that is critical in interpreting that o2 sat and that's the fact that the patient's extremities are cold Remember, if the extremities are cold, which may be an indication of vasoconstriction, when you put in the pulse ox, you might not get the best reading. Not to say this is an actual hypoxemia, uh, but just be open to the fact that you're not getting a good measurement. So patients like this, just making sure there's no rain out and maybe putting the probe right on their ear, you'll get potentially a better um, result. And something that's really important for people to understand is if your hemoglobin was two or three, what do you expect your O2 sat to be? In fact, the O2 sat should be 100%. So you can't say, oh, if someone is anemic, they're gonna have a low O2 sat because the O2 sat is just a measurement of how many of those hemoglobin molecules are oxygenated, not the actual quantity of hemoglobin, but of the ones that you're assessing, what is the saturation of that? So very important point. So with that hypoxemia, making sure it's real, but knowing that, man, I really got to evaluate for a cardiopulmonary disease process. The patient has an elevated G JVP. So now I know that there's elevations in that right atrial pressure. I don't know if it's primarily left-sided or right-sided. The fact that the lungs are clear, um, it's sort of pushing me to think this is more right-sided but don't forget, if you have a subacute to chronic left-sided process, the lymphatics can clear the lung and the lung exam is totally normal. All that's to say, you got to send the BNP, you got to get an echocardiogram, but out of the data we have now, I'm really worried about more right-sided pathology than left-sided pathology. And so I just take an anatomical approach, starting at the pulmonary artery, is there pulmonary hypertension? Is there some kind of RV dysfunction? Is there some kind of tricuspid valve dysfunction? There was no murmur on exam. And is there a restrictive or constrictive um, cardiomyopathy? So the heart, specifically the right side, becomes an area that I really need to um, assess for. There was a murmur, in fact. It was a systolic murmur. Now I'm remembering. And that systolic murmur, yes, could she have tricuspid regurge? that's causing that jugular venous distension and causing a heart failure, very possible. So we just need an echocardiogram to gain clarity. With anemia, you can have a high output failure and you can have a murmur um, and you can develop heart failure with anemia alone. So that's also a possibility. So with the physical exam, I'm making sure the pulse ox is correct and that the fingers are not cold. I'm getting a chest x-ray at minimum, but actually I might even bypass that chest x-ray and go straight to the CTA to evaluate the pulmonary vesicles, vessels. I'm getting uh, an echocardiogram, a BNP, and I'm passing the mic to Robbie because I think that covers everything on the physical exam, right, Mark? 
Okay, good. Robbie, to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. Uh, pulmonary vesicles. I'm going to call them that <laughs> forever now. Uh, so um, thank you for that really important distinction between the anemia and the hypoxia. I think that's key. And if we're like, honestly, if I'm examining this patient and looking at this in real time, I'd be so intrigued because I definitely have the benefit of uh, Prof. Rez's analysis of the thoracic exam before I'm doing this. And now we're like, okay, what are we going to try to attach this exam to? Because now I think we have made progress. So I think we can attach this person's exam to the notion that they do have anemia and then they have heart failure. So um, what is what is the added value of this exam? Well, let's analyze it. So we know when we zoom in, we see tiny little red purplish dots. Whenever you see that, you know you're seeing petechiae. And the question before you is what do those, what do what pathophysiological insult do these things represent? They tell you one thing: that blood has seeped out of the blood vessels into the skin. That's what you know. Now you have to be very, very careful about how you proceed because you know blood is made out of the skin and you know, therefore, that there's something wrong with the blood vessel. The kind of uh, pathophysiological perturbance to the blood vessel can be polar opposite. You can actually have ischemic and thrombosed blood vessels that leak fluid out because the uh, occlusion causes more proximal increase in pressure, causing the uh, blood cell to burst open. So you can have a thrombotic disease like vasculitis cause inflammation and occlusion and bursting of the blood vessel. Now, the bursting of the blood vessel, because of the wall thickness, makes it palpable. You can often feel it. You can also have a blood vessel leak because its ability to maintain homeostasis is impaired in that you are dealing with a coagulopathy. So think about it. A blood vessel can cause leak fluid because of a clot or a thrombosis like vasculitis or because of a bleeding diathesis like thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy, or an issue with a blood vessel wall. So you have to look at the remainder of the exam to see, are there other signs of bleeding or are there th signs of thrombosis? And you look at this patient's feet and you see there's no sign of ischemia whatsoever. So that dramatically lowers, lowers the possibility of a, uh, th of a thrombosis or an ischemic disorder. That's further lowered, almost completely made to zero when you see the large ecchymosis she has around her knee. So this person is very likely having bleeding into her skin. We, we translated those blood vessels leaking into the skin to be from a bleeding issue. And on the, the topic of bleeding issue, we know she's iron deficient, which further reinforces the notion or the possibility that she's bleeding. She's also on a blood thinner. Now, what do we call this exam is really, really important because we could call this petechiae and ecchymosis but there's a really important nuance that I wanted to highlight, which is uh, something I was struggling with. Look at that knee, left knee. Is that an ecchymosis in the skin or is that heme arthrosis? Is that bleeding in the actual knee joint? And how could you tell? Well, for me, the look at the ecchymosis. It's, it seems to be circumscribed around that patella. It doesn't seem to spread across the skin margins down the leg or up the thigh. So visually, I'm concerned that there might be blood in that knee, which dramatically changes the differential diagnosis because now you're dealing with surface bleeding and visceral bleeding. And there are not many things that cause hemarthrosis. So that I don't want to launch into that DDX because I would only do that if I felt the knee examined it and felt like there was fluid in it. But I'm really worried we now have to update our problem representation to include anemia, heart failure, and not just any bleeding, but bleeding with surface features in the skin and potentially features of hemarthrosis. And that second aspect is the most specific aspect yet. Um, so I'll leave it at that and, and pass the mic to you, Mark, to tell us. Uh, Robbie, can I ask you a question? Yes. Just a yeah. very brief one. Yeah. Let's say there wasn't these petechiae. You had a cold extremity. 
for some reason, the thought of phlegmasia, cerulea, dolens crossed my mind because yeah. of this asymmetric swelling. Yeah. I know you can get left-sided more than right-sided with any volume overload because that left iliac vein goes under the right iliac artery. I was just curious, like, what are your thoughts on that possibility, like a higher proximal clot yeah. um, in someone who had a, a P? Does that look like phlegmasia? A super question. There are many, many times where we can't tell if a leg is swollen because it's blocked or bleeding. And in this patient, I think the feet are the tiebreaker for me. If you look at the left foot, it doesn't appear to be swollen at all. In stark contrast to the, like the gradient between the knee and the foot seems to be that, that the, the edema is more centered around the knee. So I think in a patient who is hypercoagulable, your threshold to look for a thrombosis should be very low. She's had a stroke. But if I'm a betting person, which I'm not, I would probably lean more towards this being blood because the feet seem symmetric and the knees don't at all. And I would expect the feet to be the most affected by a thrombosis, uh, given that they're uh, at the distal margin. That's my guess. Awesome. All right, Mark, tell us more. Well, I think you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Gotcha. Um... Yeah, that's incredible. Let me just finish off this aliquant um, by giving you guys some basic labs and imaging. Um, so we have a sodium of 131 or BMP, a potassium of 3.3, a chloride of 101, a bicarb of 16, a glucose of 110, a BUN of 13, and a creatinine of 0.73. Um, we have a white blood, cell, uh, white blood cell count of 3.7 with lymphopenia, a hemoglobin of 7.2 and an MCV of 78 an RDW that was elevated at 19.9, and a platelet count of 246. Um, we also have uh, coags, which were within normal, PTT, INR. Um, some anemia studies, uh, kind of the initial studies, were a ferritin was 99, a TSAT was 15, iron was low at 34. She had a folate that was low at 4.8, a B12 that was 1100, a globin that was 215, an LDH, which was 183, um, an absolute retic count of 206,000 with a percent being 5.8 and a fiber engine of 358. Um, she had an NT pro BMP of 4,300, AST at 10, ALT of 7, ALK of 45, a total billy of 2.1, indirect billy of 1.6, TSH was within the normal limits, HIV non-reactive, hepatitis serology is within normal limits. She had a blood smear that didn't show any schistocytes. Um, she had an ESR of 32, a CRP of 7.7. .7. She had a chest X-ray that was normal with no evidence of pulmonary infiltrates. And she had an EKG that showed a right axis deviation. I could either give you the CT scan now, a CTP now, or you guys can talk about that data. I'll leave it up to you. Uh, I'll just I'm rapid fire ready. this lab and then uh, and then give Prof Rez the mic to analyze the data he's been itching for. Um, can I just say something? I well, you know what I'm really really interested in. Actually, I'm really interested in the physical exam finding, and I'm really interested to see what her teeth are like. And I'll tell you why. Um, so we're trying to analyze iron deficiency anemia, and the clues that we have, thankfully, is that um, it seems to be isolated anemia. You could take that white count and say, hmm, is this a bicytopenia? But it's near normal, and uh, um, and she doesn't have any um, markers of infection. So I would probably put a pin in that and say, okay, this is isolated anemia, but I would want an HIV test as a no-miss thing of a patient with leukopenia. Um, the fact that her TSAT is only 15, despite robust iron repletion, is very, very intriguing and supports the notion that she was, in fact, iron deficient, given how, how heroic these efforts are, and her iron is borderline um, normal. Um, she does have heart failure, and the analysis of her heart failure seems to be that uh, it is, as Prof. Rez alluded to, predominantly right-sided, given her right axis deviation. Um, I think you're starting to build a case for the possibility of a nutritional deficiency. And that nutritional deficiency, the subtle clues to that possibility are the borderline BUN. It was uh, almost single digits BUN, the low folate. Um, where is it? Yeah, um, the I had one more thought about that. Yeah, the low, um, uh, the low BUN and the low folate, but also, also that hemarthrosis. 
whenever you see hemarthrosis, ever, whenever you see hemarthrosis with a normal platelet count and a normal INR, you have to think about the possibility of a blood vessel issue. And the most common non-malignant blood vessel issue is vitamin C deficiency. So for me, um, I'm really, really starting to wonder whether there is a sneaky nutritional aspect to this case. And the major momentum for that um, is the Prof. Reza's schema about blood vessel issues. Patients bleeding with normal blood with normal platelets and normal coagulopathy, is this a blood vessel issue? A lowish BUN, a low folate, would really, really be curious about that possibility. And here's the catch. We often worry about the um, um, connective tissue manifestations of scurvy affecting the surface. The patients have poor, poor dentition, non-healing wounds, bleed in their skin, bleed in their joints, but they can, they can have connective issues affecting their cardiovascular system. Um, so that's one really small thought that is immediately actionable because if we keep going forward with more and more data, MRIs and biopsies, we forget about looking back. And looking back, I think I'd be really, really interested in getting a nutritional review of systems that is either global or targeted um, and looking for looking at her dentition. It's a very low probability inference, but it's one that you have to think about when, you, when you're bleeding with normal coags uh, and a normal platelet, and when you had flags for nutritional issues. All righty, Mark. Um, uh, Prof, has any other thoughts before you get your... All right, Mike, to you. Awesome. Um, so now some advanced imaging and then the echocardiogram as well. Um, so we have... Um, so we have a CTPE that showed no PE but a small pericardial fusion and mild dilation of the main pulmonary artery to 32 millimeters. Um, she had a TTE that showed an EF of 65%. Um, the RV was moderately to severely dilated and apex forming, and there was moderate to severely reduced RV function with severe TR and a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 60 with a grade three inter, um, inter um, atrial shunt and a moderate to large pericardial fusion um, without any evidence of tamponade um, however, noting the um, the issues with commenting on tamponade physiology with an elevated right atrial pressure. Um, on the second day of admission, she got a right heart catheterization um, that showed a right atrial pressure of 7, a pulmonary artery pressure of 67 over 26 with a mean of 41, a pulmonary vascular resistance of 11.9, a cardiac index of 2.1, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 6, and an SVR of uh, 2100. And then over the following three days, um, she became progress uh, progressively more hy hypotensive and hypoxemic, requiring a high-flow nasal cannula, prompting transfer to the medical intensive care unit. Um, in the medical intensive care unit, she was started on epinephrine, uh, sildenafil, and mesitentin um, for cardiogenic shock from RV failure. And she had rapid improvement in her shock and hypoxemia over a day after starting these pulmonary vasodilators and ionotropes. And that's the end of this aliquot. Wow. And um, Mark, just to, so I can reiterate this, she has evidence, like they did a bubble study and she has evidence of right to left-sided shunt. Yeah, and they also did a shunt run in the cath lab that also showed high-grade shunt as well. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, this is extremely helpful. And I think um, that shunting that's occurring uh probably across a pfo uh, because we yeah we got the history that the patient has a pfo and you have um, a prior ischemic stroke you have to be very concerned that there's some kind of clot that has traversed that pfo leading to um, embolic phenomenon in the brain i will say the whole idea of whether we close the pfo or we don't eh, that literature i'm not up to date with sometimes they say you close it sometimes they say don't i just know enough that you have to evaluate, like, should it be closed or not for the patient's um, sake? 
And now I want to I want to interpret the right heart cath numbers because I think um, that's something we don't often get here. And as someone who's not a pulmonologist and who doesn't review these on a regular basis, I always refer to my section and glass note uh, where I keep my information. And this is a table from up to date, and it's super helpful. And maybe Mark, you and I can really uh, dance quickly uh, in this section. So we were told that this patient's pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was like six. It was less than 15. And what that tells us is that this left heart is not involved whatsoever. The next question becomes, how much of this is isolated? It's just precapillary hypertension? Or do you have a component of precapillary and pulmonary, pulmonary vascular resistance, really trying to tell the difference between pulmonary arterial hypertension or just globally pulmonary hypertension. This patient does have pulmonary hypertension. Now we want to try to localize to where is the etiology for the pulmonary hypertension. So, so Mark, her um, pulmonary vascular resistance, was it greater than three Woods unit? Is that correct? Okay. 11, yeah, 11. Excellent. So now we have a patient who has a pulmonary vascular resistance that's greater than three um, Woods unit, has a pulmonary arterial wedge pressure that's less than 15, and a mean pulmonary arterial pressure that's greater than 20. So now you can classify her as precapillary pulmonary hypertension. Now, precapillary pulmonary hypertension can be due to pulmonary arterial hypertension, it could be due to group three, which is a lung process, but she has no evidence of a primary lung process like COPD, like OSA, or it could be due to chronic throm thromboembolic disease. This is group four, like you're sitting in a chair, it looks like a chair, but this patient had no acute PE, though the best study for that is a VQ scan, not a CTA. But and then group five is everything else, like the sickle cell, the sarcoid, and there's no evidence of that. So I really think my focus, um, Mark, is that this is probably pulmonary arterial hypertension. And when you deal with pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, Robbie has an incredible figure that we may activate later on in this um, case. But for that group, that's where you have the HIV the autoimmune diseases like lupus, she had a lymphopenia. So I'm sure we're going to repeat some serologic studies. She had an RF and a CCP that was positive. So could she have an underlying autoimmune disorder? 100%, it is possible. And even cardiac shunts can fall into this group of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Her tricuspid regurgitation is just a consequence of her pulmonary hypertension. The RV stuff that's happening, again, a consequence of that pulmonary um, hypertension. So right now with the data that we have, I'm most concerned for group one pulmonary um, hypertension. And let me just quickly go on to this because I'm sure I included, um, you see, let me just pull this up real quick. We're going from schema to schema. Uh, but I think, Robbie, I have your beautiful figure here inserted in my um, last note. Let's see if uh, Robbie has delivered today or not. <laughs> of course, he has. And this is his just beautiful schema for pulmonary arterial hypertension. That's what I'm most concerned for. These are the common causes here is genetic and idiopathic. But look at this, folks, non-inflammatory vitamin C deficiency. So could vitamin C deficiency be causing her pulmonary hypertension, her petechial rash, a clot that has traversed a PFO and shot up to the brain? All very, very possible. But here are the other, you have inflammatory and non-inflammatory. Her ESR, I think, was 37 and her CRP was 7. So there is a little bit of inflammation, but just take a good look at this. We're going to evaluate for autoimmune causes right here, including lupus mixed connective tissue disease. We already have an HIV. She's not at risk for schistosomiasis based on her uh, geography. And then we're going to evaluate for nutritional stuff, vitamin C and B12 deficiency. So I'm going to stop sharing this for a second. I just want to say the, the pericardial effusion oftentimes 
Um, we know that this was slowly growing because when you get to moderate to severe, it should cause tamponade unless the tempo was slow. And for that, you think about endocrine disorders like thyroid disease, you think about autoimmune disorders, you think about malignancy as well. So all this is to say, Robbie, if I were to uh, put a problem list for her in that problem list, I would have pulmonary hypertension, likely group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. I would have bleeding diaphysis. I would have hypercoagulability. I think those three would be the primary stuff we need to mention. But because this is such a rich part of the case, Robbie, anything else to add or any other analysis of the data so far? I will do so silently. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all I got to say, my friends. That was so beautiful. Um, I love the the uh, complicated aspect of the shunt here. I have to think about... Um, does this mean that she could be at risk of pulmonary? I have a knowledge gap. I loved everything you said. And I realized that um, if she has a PFO and then she has a right to left shunt, which means that that should not cause pulmonary hypertension because it should be a left to right shunt overloading that. But I realize I don't know this confidently. So I have to read more about it to understand it better. You know uh -huh. what I think might have happened? I once had a patient at Hopkins yeah. who had a PFO and essentially got a PE, had a rise in the pulmonary hypertension, and then opened up that shunt mm. right to left. So That's I wonder if her pulmonary hypertension, which I Beautiful. think is the main lesion, is driving the tricusp regurge, is driving the right to left shunt. And we have to answer why pulmonary hypertension. This is why we call you Prof. Rez. <laughs> Um, Mark, before you give the next data, was all the interpretation correct of that? Because I don't interpret these often. I would love for you to add and teach us as well. Spot on. The physiology was brilliant. All right, let's get the whiteboard back up and Mark, take over the mic. Awesome. Um, so we got some further labs. Um, so some of the autoimmune serologies that you requested, we had an ANA that was negative a double strand of the DNA that was negative, an SSA and SSB that was negative, an SCL70 that was negative, complements that were within normal limits. Um, we also had an RF and CCP this time that was actually negative, um, a copper and zinc that was within normal limits. Um, we got a hemoglobin electrophoresis, which was also within normal limits. I mentioned the HIV earlier that was uh, non-reactive. Um, and then really during her stay, her hemoglobin really stayed around seven, her white blood cell needed around two, um, still lymphopenic, and her platelets really were low normal, around 150. Um, and the next aliquot will reveal the final diagnosis. Oh, one last thing. She also got a CTEF or a VQ scan um, that was negative for uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, uh, Mark, that was super, super helpful. I think that um, I think the negative CTEF really pushes the needle towards class one pulmonary hypertension because the two are uh, class one and class four are, are indis indistinguishable on the on the cath numbers that you just provided. So I think we really are in that category. And I think with the negative um, autoimmune stuff that um, you have shared, I think we move closer and closer to the non-inflammatory category. And so I think the active questions in my mind are, I don't know, I'm, I've forgotten, my confidence is looser about the shunt physiology and wondering about that. But I think um, the way that esoteric pulmonary hypertension plays out is you have to think about the nutritional category. And if that is not at play, um, uh, doing a thorough um, uh, genetic review of systems. But I think um, it's really, really hard for my mind to skip over the scurvy hypothesis now. And if you tell me that her um, uh, her she doesn't respond to vitamin C or she does have nothing suggestive of scurvy, I think the things that I would worry about are at the bottom of that inflammatory category. Cancers can cause rapid pulmonary hypertension and sneak up on you. Um but I, I honestly, because of that hemarthrosis, my mind is too stubborn. I can't even think about anything else now until, uh, until you mention and tell us more about that uh, nutritional history. It is telling the CBC 
in patients with copper deficiency and vitamin C, the two Cs, copper and vitamin C, they tend to have more leukopenia along with the anemia. In patients with B12 deficiency, the other nutritional cause of anemia, they tend to have more thrombocytopenia along with the anemia. So here, her low-grade leukopenia, her anemia, and that hemarthrosis, I would be very, very worried about um, about scurvy here. And I think the major reflection I'll share, and I know Prof. Rez and I discussed a case a long time ago, is it doesn't have to be a global nutritional deficiency. There can be selective avoidance of uh, vitamin C, nutrition, citrus uh, fruit um, containing uh, vitamin C containing food. So I'm 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 stuck. I can't think about anything else, which is always a bad thing, honestly, in real life. Um, I'm I'm curious where you are, Prof. Rez. Where is your mind at? How can they be anywhere else other than where you are? But I would love for you to just repeat that pearl about the copper vitamin C and then the B12. Which lines go down? I've never heard that before. Oh yeah, Prof. Rez, if if we're trying, if you're making a list of nutritional deficiencies and cytopenias, the the notion that uh, if you find a specific nutritional deficiency, your uh, the the common ones are B12, folate, uh, vitamin C, and copper. Um. And the folate and uh, B12 cause anemia and thrombocytopenia. The two Cs, copper and um, and vitamin C, tend to actually spare the platelet count and affect the white blood cell count a little bit more. Um, so yeah, another... that's why I love you so much. Look at that detail; that's insane. Um, well, anyways, Mark, Mark, to you, my friend. Awesome. Can I um can I share my screen again? I have a very cool photo for you guys. Um, so I'll say dermatology was consulted. Um, also too, you know, with this possible history of uh, RA and you know, could there be some sort of vasculitic process going on? So dermatology was consulted for a punch biopsy, and they did a dermoscopy. Um, am I? He's about to show hairs that I wish existed on my head. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to see it, folks. Transplant those to my da, head, da, my da. Rob, you made my answer is to go on a vitamin C deficient diet, get the hairs, and put it on my head. Oh, Prof. Rez, the official <laughs> magician. <laughs> so those those are corkscrew hairs and perifollicular hemorrhages. Um, so the, you can only really tell once you do the uh, do the dermoscopy that those petechiae are solely surrounding the hair follicles. Classic for vitamin C deficiency and scurvy. Uh, I don't know what to say. This is this is a case that is so full of learning in so many ways. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know where to begin, honestly. I'm just curious for my sake, because I I'm growing on the physical exam aspect of things. Mark, what was your what was the team's conclusion about the knee? Was that just blood on the skin or was it in the knee? Because I I think it was very easy to put a lot of weight in that, but you might have been uh, corrected by uh, smarter people um, in the in house. What was the thought on the knee? Yeah, and I'll just mention two more things. I probably should say the vitamin C level. Um, I said the vitamin C level was undetectable. Um, and then I was so I took care of this patient right after that got diagnosed um, with scurvy. And the um, one of my co-residents said they went to bedside and said, you know, um, so how's your diet been? And, and and the patient was like, Doc, I haven't had a fruit or vegetable in ten years. I'm allergic to citrus. Um, so that was just like the mic drop moment of wow. That's yeah. Um, but the knee, uh, the knee, yeah, there, there was a x-ray that was done that, um, you know, really didn't show just sort of a little bit of like superficial swelling it was thought that it was probably just uh, superficial bleeding, but I guess, um, yeah, tough to, tough to tell. I just wanted to thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm on service right now, so I have to break off for rounds, but I, I just want to tell the audience, like, if you're not following Mark on Twitter, I don't know what you're doing. He puts out these amazing daily teaching bits with a graphic. So highly recommend you follow him. It's at Mark underscore Heslin. And um, if you're following him, follow me too. Anyways, Robbie, nice discussing with you. I'll see you later, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to take a moment to reiterate that. I mean, I think I mean, if all of you are either have seen 30 year residents in the hospital or, um, uh, or are one, um, you know that it takes a very, very special person to take an hour of the middle of their day to present a case like this. Um, and to present it in the way you did, Mark, is unreal. You also have the best poker face ever. I will never play poker with you. I don't play poker, really, but I would never play poker with you because it's impossible to read your uh, your body language. Um, really, really, a lot of gratitude for sharing this case with us and doing so 
in such an elegant way and doing so um, uh, in the middle of a, a busy day. I'm really curious what it felt like for you to look at this patient's journey and digest it yourself. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I would say, yeah, pulmonary uh, scurvy leading to primary pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension was definitely not on my radar. And the main the main case reports are honestly in kids. There's not there's not much literature in adults at all. And I was reading that essentially that um, vitamin C is important in, in nitric oxide synth um, synthesis. Um, so if you don't have vitamin C, you don't have nitric oxide, and you just cause vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries. And then also like upregulates hypoxia inducible factor. So there's some also some vasoconstriction from there. But honestly, like I'm just thinking, you know, how can I get to this diagnosis? Um, kind of. Um, playing the Monday morning quarterback. And honestly, like Re Reza's schema for bleeding is just like a beautiful thing. Um, because if you kind of take that schema and you see that the platelets are normal, the coags are normal, it doesn't, we're not getting much flavor for vasculitis. And then you kind of localize to the vasculopathy. That list is is pretty short. There's not too much, uh, too many things that cause a vasculopathy. And then, and then you kind of go back and you kind of look at the labs. You're like, wow, refractory iron deficiency anemia to multiple IV iron infusions. And the T cell is still low, you know, scurvy, you know, obviously vitamin C is involved in iron absorption and then folate deficiency. Oh, actually, uh, you know, um, scurvy and vitamin C deficiency is important for folate reabsorption as well. Um, so you kind of scrutinize those labs a little bit. So I think that's how, you know, I kind of put it together in the end, but it's just, I mean, going back to the bed, I couldn't imagine with the resident going back to the bedside and the patient saying they haven't had a fruit or vegetable in 10 years, uh, what, you know, what was on their face, but, and then also just closing the, uh, um, the loop on the hypoxemia. So it was thought that, you know, she has this PFO, but um, there's not going to be much left to right shunting le leading to, because it's a PFO and not like a congenital ASD. And honestly, the hypoxemia, kind of like Reza was saying, is that the pulmonary pressures got so high that finally the uh, PFO opens and then there is more um, right to left shunting and then hypoxemia. And that's why when the pulmonary vasodilators were started, the hypoxemia vanished within like minutes. It was like a ridiculous thing, supposedly in the ICU. Um, but yeah, just an amazing case. I mean, this scurvy goes back to like 4,000 BC. So it's, it's pretty cool to like go, you know, go back into history to this uh, diagnosis. Well, I think you've made history today, my friend. I think many people are saying that this is one of their favorite cases, if not their favorite. And I can see why it's it's on uh, on the top for you and uh, certainly at or near the top for me. A really, really cool experience. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, and uh, we'll pass the mic to Tansu to uh, take us through the journey. I'm truly mind blown. What a case, Mark. Thank you so much um, for this amazing case and great discussion. Sorry, I'm not able to turn on my camera because my connection is unstable. Um, I hope I'm not going to get cut off. So uh, we had a 37-year-old female patient with two months of progressive dyspnea to begin with. And her disease course was subacute. And whenever we hear subacute disease, uh, we should be either thinking about a subacute presentation of a common disease or a, co a compressed version of a chronic disease. And whenever we see a patient who has dyspnea at the bedside, it's very important to walk the patient because the key word here is exertion. When the patient uh, is uh, dyspneic during walking, then uh, we have to be worried about dyspnea on exertion, which is a different schema than just shortness of breath. And we have to check the patient's heart rate and uh, oxygen saturation. And 95% of the cases in dyspnea uh, involve the heart and lung problem. And in that we have to think anatomically. And we shouldn't forget about the blood and other causes that can cause dyspnea on exertion uh, or dyspnea in general could be thyroid disease, metabolic acidosis, and deconditioning. And physical exam is more specific than sensitive, and we have to do it carefully. Here, the patient was on Nivaroxaban, which is a DOAC, and the patient also had rash. And when we hear about rash, we started uh, thinking about whether this rash is bruising or petechiae. And uh, here, we activated our bleeding schema. In an in our bleeding schema, we consider three possibilities. So either this is bleeding secondary to trauma or coagulopathy, and we should check the platelets, PT and PTT here, or is this a vessel problem? And in the vessel category, we have many possibilities such as vasculopathy, vasculitis, or a thrombosed vessel, which causes a proximal increase in the pressure and vessels burst, um, and we see the signs of bleeding in the skin. And here, our patient, we checked our patient for other signs of bleeding or thrombosis, and we couldn't see any clue for thrombosis here. 
the patient had come hemarthrosis though in the knee, uh, but his feet, uh, her feet looked symmetric. So we were uh, more worried about a bleeding issue than a thrombotic issue. And our patients with petechia and dyspnea overlap made us think about um, is there bleeding into the lungs that's causing the dyspnea uh, or is there bleeding elsewhere? And then we decided that it's best to evaluate the pulmonary vascular system here with a CT with contrast. And when we think about our patient's past medical history, she had stroke and strong stroke in young patient. Uh, we activate um, our schema of uh, prioritizing hemorrhage secondary to trauma first. Then we activate our ischemia schema, uh, the three Ps, pump, pipes, and plasma disorders causing stroke in a young patient. And here in pump, infective endocarditis is an important consideration, and in pipes, dissection is an important consideration. Our patient had high JVP, her lungs were clear, so we started thinking that she is probably having a right-sided heart problem. And here, um, we, uh, the concern for the left-sided heart problem was tempered uh, uh, via active lymphatic drainage in the lungs. So um, we weren't at the beginning sure whether this was a right heart problem or a left heart problem. But then when we got the VQ scan and the right heart catheterization, we understood that this was a right the heart problem. And then uh, when we think about uh, the, our updated problem representation here, uh, we, it includes anemia, heart failure, bleeding with uh, surface features, and hemarthrosis. Given the patient's normal platelets and INR, uh, we started thinking about other causes for bleeding, for hemarthrosis, and uh, one of them being vitamin C deficiency. And whenever we think about vitamin C deficiency, uh, which causes scurvy, we should think about poor dentition, bleeding in the wounds, joints, and visceral uh, bleeding as well, visceral problems. And then uh, we, we try to localize uh, the patient's pulmonary hypertension, uh, and Prof. Rez shared with us his schema uh, of pre-capillary, post-capillary, and both pre- and post-capillary uh, causes for uh, pulmonary hypertension. And um, Classically, we have five groups of pulmonary hypertension, but here we thought that uh, it's likely that the patient has group one pulmonary hypertension here. And then we invoke the inflammatory versus non-inflammatory causes. And the nutritional deficiencies is actually one of the causes of non-inflammatory group one uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension here. Um, and the patient truly had vitamin C deficiency, which was evident in dermoscopy with the corkscrew hair. And we heard from Robbie that a great pearl that I noted here, vitamin C and copper spares the platelets, causes leukopenia, B12 and folate deficiency causes anemia and thrombocytopenia, so they don't spare the platelets. And that's all from me. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great day. Oh my gosh, Tansu, you're, uh, you're the vitamin C to absorbing all this information and somehow laying it out so effortlessly. It was so, so good. Two days in a row. Thank you so much. Um, all right, y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, and uh, we're excited to welcome all of you back tomorrow for another IMGVMR at the same time tomorrow. So see you then. Bye.